Welcome back to the guide, Exile. After defeating the massive contorting spider Arakali, you will move into Act 8, starting in the Sarn Ramparts. This zone is linear in nature, having you perform a left-hand wall follow until you reach a break in the outer defensive wall of the Sarn Encampment. Enter this hole to get to its top, and follow it to the Sarn Encampment. In the Sarn Encampment, head to the left and enter the Toxic Conduits. You may pick up the quests if you like, but it is not required. In the Toxic Conduits, you will want to go in the direction of the black paint splotch on the ground right as you enter the zone, either up or down. After this, you will go as far right as possible to enter the entrance to Dodre's Cesspool. Dodre's Cesspool, much like the previous Toxic Conduits, starts with a circular connection, so you can either go left or right and they will connect back to each other at the end. Here the path to the next zone can spawn on the right, bottom, or left of this circular connection. There are a few small dead-end rooms, but once you find a leading offshoot, follow it all the way to the end to reach Dodre's Arena. Here you will again encounter Dodre from Act 4, however, she will have now lost a little weight and has become much more agile. It is recommended to have the following for this encounter. This is a very tricky and annoying fight as Dodre will apply many debuffs to you, move around quickly, and deal heavy damage. Moving to the center of the arena, you can begin the fight by turning the valve. This valve is used throughout the fight to maintain the debuffs that are being applied to you. We will first look at the moves that Dodre can perform, aside from the debuffs that she spawns. Bubble Burst. Dodre will throw a bubble projectile at a target location, morphing into multiple bubbles that explode in small areas of effect. Wand Strike. Dodre slings three projectiles at a target. These will always pierce. Warp. Dodre teleports to a target location, disappearing and reappearing within a bubble with an accompanying explosion. Now outside of these moves are her three color debuffs that she applies. For simplicity, we will refer to these by their main colors, green, purple, and red. As mentioned before, these can be controlled by the valve in the center of the room. The green debuff will spawn green mobs randomly, applying a debuff to you once you kill them, making you deal 7% less damage, with a maximum stack of 10. The purple debuff spawns clouds randomly, applying a chaos degeneration and slowing you by 7% per stack, with a max stack of 10. The red debuff will spawn bubbles randomly, that will pop and apply a debuff to you that makes you take 10% increased damage with a maximum stack of 10. With these debuffs, you will want to do your best to avoid them, but that is very difficult. Luckily, you are able to reset the arena and remove the debuffs by turning the valve at the center of the room. Do this every time you feel that you are being overwhelmed. The debuffs will shift in a cyclical pattern alphabetically, from green to purple to red. Once Dodre is defeated, leave the arena through the conduit and tag the waypoint. From here, you will want to go to the left and enter the Grand Promenade. The Grand Promenade is a fairly static and linear zone. You will just want to follow the fenced ledge on the right, all the way up and to the right, using a movement skill where possible to cross the small aqueducts to enter the bathhouse. In the bathhouse, tag the waypoint and move down, then to the right and back up into the main room to encounter the unique miniboss Hector Titicus, Eternal Servant. He will simply shield charge around leaving red projectiles behind him, sometimes stopping to attack you. Defeat him and take the wings of Asteri from the chest. If you need to complete your Trial of Ascendancy, you may do that here, marked by the dark green path on the guide map. It swaps places with the entrance to the High Guardians, either on the top left or top right of the zone. Now you want to head to the bottom right of the zone to reach the Lunaris Concourse, marked by the one on the guide map. If you wish to kill the optional Minor God, Yugal, for the passive point, you may head to the High Guardians entrance, marked by the two on the guide map first. However, it is recommended to just come back to this Minor God at a higher level. Since we were here, we will cover this Minor God. The High Guardians, much like the Grand Promenade, is a linear zone. Simply follow the fenced terrace all the way to the entrance to the boss arena. Here, you will encounter Yugal, a minor god that specializes in infuriating mechanics. Yugal is quite the encounter, requiring good movement skills and quick reaction time to avoid his arena mechanics and fast leaping skills. It is recommended to have the following for this encounter. In this arena, there are also four pools that will apply chill if you walk in them. Be sure to avoid these during the encounter. This is a three-phase fight. Phase one will occur from 100% to 66% life. Yugal will perform the following moves. A basic melee attack, Yugal will strike at the chosen target with his mouth. Charge. Yugal will charge at a target location, dealing more damage the further that he travels. Cone Strike. Yugal charges up, striking the area in front of him with a cone of liquid. Leap Slam. Yugal pounces at a chosen target, dealing damage in a small area of effect. Manifestation of Fear. For every 5% of life that Yugal loses, he will summon a Manifestation of Fear orb, these will track targets applying a cold degeneration and chill. The cold degeneration can stack if numerous manifestations reach you, so always be on the move from these. At 90% life, Yugal will activate one of the pools with a totem that fires 6 projectiles every 8 seconds. These projectiles pierce and explode after the last one is fired. 
The rest of these pools will be activated during the phase changes. Now at 66% life, Yugle will retreat into one of the pools, summoning another pool totem and beginning the add spawn for the end of phase 1. In the add spawn, Yugle will summon 10 reflections of Yugle. These are unique monsters that mimic Yugle and use Leap Slam and a projectile barrage. Once these are defeated, they will move the fight into the next phase. Phase 2 will last from 66% life to 33% life. In Phase 2, Yugle will perform the same moves as in Phase 1. And at 33% life, he will retreat back into the pools, activating the rest of the pool totems and performing another add spawn. Phase 3 will last from 33% life to 0% life. In this phase, Yugle performs the same moves as Phase 1 and 2, however he gets one extra move, Empowered Manifestations. Yugle will roar, pulsing in a large AoE that grants the manifestations of fear that he has spawned increased speed. Be sure to keep on the move during this time. Once Yugle is defeated, you can portal back to town and take the waypoint back to the bathhouse and continue to the Lunaris Concourse. In the Lunaris Concourse, modeled after the Ebony Barracks from Act 3, you will want to head up and to the right and grab the waypoint, and then head straight up to the successive staircases to get to the entrance to the Lunaris Temple. The Lunaris Temple Level 1 has the same layouts as in Act 3, just with some new enemies and ambience. Make your way through the zone to reach the waypoint and entrance to Level 2. Again, like the previous level, level 2 of the Lunaris Temple has the same layouts as in Act 3. You will want to make your way up the successive staircases until you reach the main carpeted floor. Here you will want to go in the direction of the single vase on the opposite wall, away from the broken carts. Move around and through the cages to reach the portal to the boss of the Lunaris Temple, Dusk Harbinger of Lunaris. It is recommended to have the following for this encounter. Dusk will perform the following moves. A basic projectile attack, Dusk will attack with two basic arrow projectiles that fire in arcs that overlap at a set point. Barrage. Dusk quickly charges up five projectiles that fire in rapid succession. Charged Backstep. Dusk performs a long charge and fires a beam, quickly stepping back during the process. Mortar. Dusk charges a slow-moving arrow projectile that splits into ten smaller projectiles at a target location. These smaller projectiles explode in a small AoE and can overlap. Black Vortex. The Lunaris Moon in the center of the room will fire out black vortexes that deal cold damage over time if stood in. After defeating Dusk, take the Moon Orb and teleport back to town. Here you can turn in your respective quests and then take the waypoint back to the Toxic Conduits. You will now want to head to the right to enter the key. The key is mostly a linear zone with a split ending, one side leading to the Grain Gate marked by the 3 on the guide map and an arena marked by the 2 on the guide map. Start off by heading down into the zone looking for a thin linear bridge heading left to a large square platform as marked by the 1 on the guide map. Take the Ankh of Eternity from the chest, head back over the bridge and back down into the zone. You will first want to look for the arena in the bottom left to use the previous item that we just acquired. If you end up finding the grain gate first, enter it, tag the waypoint and return to the key to find the arena. In the arena, simply defend Clarissa and defeat Tolman after the ritual to complete the quest for a passive point. If you have already found the Grain Gate, teleport to town and take the waypoint to the Grain Gate. Otherwise, exit the arena and find the Grain Gate in the bottom right as marked on the guide map by the three. The Grain Gate is a somewhat complex, building-strewn zone with no clear way through it. However, there are clear markers that can help you make heads or tails of the buildings that you are supposed to go through. You will only want to travel through buildings with the dead guards outside of their doors. In general, you will want to be heading up and right through this zone. Keep an eye out for the Gemling Legion in this zone as you can defeat them for a passive point. They are generally in the opening just before the last building to the entrance of the Imperial Fields. In the Imperial Fields, simply follow the road up through the zone, tag the waypoint and continue moving up even after the road ends to reach the entrance to the Solaris Temple. The Solaris Temple Level 1 has an upside down T layout with a waypoint just above its crossing. You will enter from the right side of the temple and want to head left and then up to the waypoint, and continue up into the entrance of Solaris Level 2. The left side of the path will bring you to the Solaris Concourse, which you do not need to enter at all. Level 2 of Solaris Temple has a similar layout to Level 2 of the Solaris Temple in Act 3. Here you will want to follow the carpet through the main hallways until you reach the portal to the boss of the Solaris Temple, Don Harbinger of Solaris. It is recommended to have the following for this encounter. Don will perform the following moves. A basic melee attack. Don will perform a basic melee attack with his maces. Bladefall. Don casts a bladefall that deals physical damage along with summoning 8 animated blades that also deal physical damage. Scorching Ray. Dawn will select a target and cast Scorching Ray on them for 6 seconds. Thrown Shield. Dawn throws his shield. Once the shield hits target location, it will break into 5 projectiles. Both of these portions of the move can hit. Vertical Fire Beams. Dawn will summon between 2 to 4 vertical fire beams that will travel around him dealing fire damage over time. Burning Ground Beam. 
The Solaris Sun will target a location and strike it with a fiery beam, dealing fire damage over time, as well as creating burning ground beneath it. After defeating Dawn, take the Sun Orb and teleport back to the Sarn Encampment. Turn in the respective quests and then take the waypoint to the Lunaris Concourse. Here you'll want to head down from the waypoint and enter Harbor Bridge. In the Harbor Bridge, head right until you find the center of the battle between the Lunaris and Solaris Fanatics. Enter the arena and activate the two statues of Lunaris and Solaris. It is recommended to have the following for this encounter. Initially, when you begin the encounter, neither boss will be aggressive towards you and will instead battle each other. You may attack either boss at this point. The first boss to reach 90% life will retreat back to the pedestal and take the form of their deity, Solaris transforming into a sun and Lunaris transforming into a moon. They will then support the other boss in her main form. First we will look at the Lunaris phase. During this phase you will be fighting Lunaris with Solaris assisting her from her sun form on the pedestal. Lunaris will perform the following moves. Glaive Projectiles. Lunaris will throw her glaives in a similar manner to Spectral Throw. This is her effective default attack. Combo Melee Attack. Lunaris will attack with three AoE melee attacks in quick succession. Cyclone. Lunaris prepares and then spins quickly in a target direction, throwing numerous glaives over the Cyclone's travel. Solaris will perform the following moves. Burning Ground Beam. The Solaris Sun will target a location and strike it with a fiery beam, dealing fire damage over time and creating burning ground beneath it. Solar Flare. The Solaris Sun will target a location and lay fire upon it in a cone shape, creating a large portion of burning ground. During the Solaris phase, you will be fighting Solaris with Lunaris assisting her from her moon form on the pedestal. Solaris will perform the following moves. Energy Beam. Solaris fires a beam from a small charged orb in front of her. Spear Thrust. Solaris will quickly charge her spear, thrusting it at targets in front of her. Shield Beam. Solaris charges a fiery beam from her shield, dealing rapid hits. Charged Spear. Solaris places her spear into the ground, replacing it with an energized spear. Shortly after this, she throws the spear, creating four successive explosions of four projectiles that expand in an X-shaped pattern. The best way to avoid this move is to stand behind her. Lunaris will perform the following moves. Black Vortex. The Lunaris Moon will fire a dark vortex at the ground, dealing cold degeneration and applying chill within its AoE. S Barrage. The Lunaris Moon will rain down projectiles that form an S-shape. These projectiles start from either end of the S and converge at the center. At 75% life, 50% life, and 25% life, Lunaris and Solaris will swap places respectively depending on whom you are fighting. These phase changes will grant flask charges. Once one of the sisters have been defeated, the other will return to her human form and retain the moves that she had as her deity form, meaning that Lunaris will gain the same moves as she had while she was a moon, and Solaris will gain the same moves she had while she was a sun. Once they have been defeated, you have now completed Act 8. Now make your way to the Blood Aqueducts to begin your trek through Act 9. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one, Exile.